Good morning. Hey, that's more like it. <laughs> what a welcome everybody here to First Baptist Church Grace Summit. I am Chris Harst. What a welcome any new guests that we might have and uh, ask that if you would please fill out one of the white cards in the back of the pew. Um, and also to say welcome to those of us that we have online. If you would please, uh, if you text 636-742-1011, say hi. And for anybody else online, if you would please, you can hit a like or a comment. Got a few announcements and we will get started. So, first of all, Wednesdays at 5.30 we have Easter Choir Rehearsal. See Miss Sarah. <laughs> Wednesday, 1st of March, 9.30 a.m., Backpacking at Grace Summit Methodist Church. Thursday, we have March 2nd, 4.30 p.m., Deacon's Meeting. Saturday, March 11th at 8 a.m. is Men's Breakfast. Is that still at Franklin's? Franklin's so far. Okay. And then, Mon I'm sorry, March 20th to 23rd, we have prayer meetings for Engage Conference. You can see the bulletin about that. March, uh, I'm sorry, March 22nd through 29th is the Engage Conference itself. And then April 19th through the 21st is the FBC Grace Summit Women's Conference. Again, you can see Ms. Sarah Schmidt for more information. Brother Tommy. Thank you, Ms. Chris. Hey, uh, got another thing before we pray. Got another thing that is a need of ours. Uh, from nominating committee, we need social committee members. Uh, what does social committee do? Social committee does some of our big events. Uh, fall festival is the first one that comes to mind, right? They help out with the Thanksgiving banquet. And they do other things throughout the year that are important. And we're, we're, we could use some help in that area. And so if that's an interest to you, would you come see me? Would you come write me an email on the, uh, with my email with the... Uh, on the bulletin there, teachmentministry at gmail.com, would you write me and tell me that that might be an interest to you? Because we could use some help with that. Social committees met, and uh, we've kind of determined about, uh, among ourselves, hey, we could use some extra people in here. So if that's something that you can do and you might be interested in or you might just want to ask some questions about, you come see me, and uh, I can set you up with the right people at least, and uh, that would be a great help to me as well. Hey, let's pray, and then we're going to have the prelude. This was a great moment. Somebody mentioned on um, Wednesday night, last Wednesday, that they love this prelude time because it gives them a chance to breathe and to still their heart before the Lord. And so I invite you to do that very same thing as we uh, begin our service. Let's consecrate ourselves to the Lord. This is a day that we will observe the Lord's Supper too, so just prepare yourself in your mind for that and what that means, and let's build some space so that we can, we can dwell on the Lord. Let's pray together. Father... We thank you for this day that you have made and you've given to us. Lord, let, let us consecrate this time on your day that we might honor you with our, not only our words, not only with our singing, not only with our hearing, not only with our, our response, but Lord, just our heart as well, our spirit, would, we would love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength as you've given us, you've told us to do. And we pray, Lord, that it would overflow into love for our neighbor, Lord, that we would love to tell uh, our, our neighbors about Jesus and about your love. And we pray that you would be glorified in this time that we have together. And, and Father, we would be transformed more into the image of Jesus. We pray in his precious name. Amen. Let's hear the prelude together.
let's sing to the Lord today together.
sermon today and I pray that it would speak to your soul as well.
Christ my Savior and my God. As our ushers come to receive our offering, let's pray for our morning offering and for the remainder of our worship time again. opportunity to be here in your house this morning, Lord. We just thank you for the freedom we have that we can come and worship you. Lord, be with Brother Tommy this morning as he brings a message to us and from your word, Lord, that we will benefit from this, Lord. Be with this offering now, Lord. Bless the gift and the giver. We use your honor and your glory. These things we have to your name. Amen. Children are dismissed to Children's Church. <laughs> One of those kids was like, all right. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> cool. It is amazing how technology has changed us, isn't it? I mean, when you really think about it, it is incredible how technology has changed us. Most of it's for the better. I don't, I don't want to go back, right? I, we have nostalgic feelings for whenever I didn't have all the, you know, I didn't have this ball and chain in my pocket, right? This, this box of demons in my pocket all the time, right? But uh, I, the convenience of it, the ease of it, man, it is a great thing, but it is a double-edged sword, right? One of the things that's funny that I've noticed is I, I see these videos, and you probably do too, sometimes on social media, sometimes on YouTube, and sometimes on the news, and, of people fighting or of a disaster happening, and, and you're watching this, never even maybe realizing that uh, somebody had to be holding the camera of that phone to get that video. In order for you to watch that video, someone took out their camera and video recorded it, right? We're so conditioned to watching videos from phone cameras, we forget that they exist, that the camera must exist. Or maybe I'm the only one that feels that way, right? Uh, but, but it's a phenomenon that I think is interesting, right? And so now, when a video pops up on my phone of kids, let's say, beating up on another kid on the school bus, I, I can't help but shout, put down your phone. Put down your phone and get, go, go get a teacher. Go tell somebody. Go deal with this, right? Life has many bystanders, but very few helpers. Have you noticed that? Life has many bystanders, but very few helpers. And I've seen videos even where the camera pans, and you see that everybody else that's watching this, somebody having a fit, somebody having a mental breakdown, some, you know, some car exploding, right? The, the, car, the camera pans, and you notice everybody else is gathered around, and guess what? All of them have their camera phone too. We, we, we live life through the camera instead of being helpful. Everybody wants internet points. Very few people want to be helpful. Have you noticed that? Everybody wants to live through the camera to gain a moment, but we don't want to in that moment act. And there are moments that you wish that someone would take up for you, that someone would to put down the metaphorical camera phone and get in the fray and, and help you out of that disaster. 
And I'm just being real here this morning, but sometimes does it ever feel like life is just beating you down and you can't even muster the voice to defend yourself? Does it ever feel like there's maybe this black rain cloud that is just kind of following you everywhere you go like some sort of Peanuts cartoon strip? You can't seem to get away from it all. And it's in those moments that here is a truth that holds me together. The book of Hebrews calls Jesus our high priest. And that might not mean anything to you today. And maybe if you weren't raised Catholic, you have no interaction with anybody that was a priest ever in your life. But I hope by the time we're done here today that you will be able to say with me, I have a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. And that you can own that truth together in those moments of hardness. Because once we seize on that doctrinal reality, I believe it changes everything. So I want to take a moment and look to the scriptures with you and see what that means together. And so here's what I want you to do. If you have your copy of God's Word, and I hope you do, or have some, some way to access the Bible so that you can look at it with me. We're going to have it on the screens, but there's nothing beats being able to see it in front of you. And so I, I would encourage you to look at Hebrews chapter 4. Let's turn there, there together. Hebrews chapter 4, you might take out an iPad as long as you don't let it distract you, as long as you're not playing Angry Birds or Floppy Bird or whatever those, as long as you're not doing that, go ahead and turn there, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 through 16, that's where we're going to be at. A little backstory before we stand up. The writer of Hebrews is writing to a mostly Jewish church, and they were living in the Roman Empire after the time of Jesus. And it would have been okay had they just been a regular old Jewish community. See, the, the Roman Empire, they knew about the Jewish folks and Judaism and their temple and their cleanness and all of that stuff. And, and they were okay. They tolerated that. But now that they had become these weird Christians, this small, like, religious sect that, that the Roman Empire didn't know about, now that had changed everything. So now they were facing ostracization from their fellow Jewish folks, and they were facing hardship from the Romans. And it would have been easy in that moment for them to look back when it was a whole lot easier, when life was a whole lot easier, a whole lot simpler before they were Christians. In other words, they were not living their best life now. That's what I'm saying to you today. And the writer of Hebrews is writing them to, hey, you need to stick with Jesus. The Old Testament is not enough, right? The Old Testament, all the questions that are in the Old Testament find their answer in Jesus. And so once you have that, once you have the fulfillment, don't look back, don't go back. And one of those things is fulfilled in the Old Testament. The Old Testament talks so much of that finds its answer in Jesus is that idea of a priesthood. And so I want to read this, and then I want to talk a little bit about that, and then we're going to jump into to all the things that we're going to talk about. So if you found that, if you'd stand, let's read Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 through 16. And, uh, and then we're going to explore this. Let's go. Therefore, since we have a great high priest, who is passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Boy, we're gonna, we're just gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna ring this for all the water we can. This is gonna be great. I'm so excited. Let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. Do you feel beat down today? you feel like just a cloud is following you everywhere you go? you feel like nobody wants to jump in? There's no help. There's many bystanders, many people that are glad to watch you in the car wreck called life, but very few people that would help you. You have a great high priest whose name is Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? <clears throat> Father, help me to believe it. Help me to live it. And Lord, let me not stand up here without it making all the difference in my life as well. Father, that, that, that I might not, after preaching, might disqualify myself. And Father, in the leadership in this room, let it be true that they rest and find their peace and wholeness in a great high priest named Jesus. And Lord, for everybody that is in this room, Lord, I love them. You love them. But let them, Lord, not not go away from here thinking that they are really alone. But they have Jesus Christ, the righteous, an advocate for them. And Lord, everyone that is in the sound of my voice, on the other end of a live stream somewhere, Father, let them know this truth as well and your spirit be abundantly present as it already is in this place. Would you give us strength 
to hear from your word, to understand it and to apply it to our life in a greater way. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. amen. Go ahead and take a seat. This idea of a priest, the priest is a mediator between God and man. I'm going to say that again because if we don't get that much, we're, we're not going to understand the rest of this. A priest is a mediator between God and man. He's a go-between He's a negotiator, you might say, between God and man. In the Old Testament, the priests, they, they took these offerings, they took these gifts from God's people, sometimes to cover up sin, sometimes to promote cleanliness, sometimes just as an act of worship and devotion. They would take these gifts and they would mediate between God's people and God himself. And the high priest, there was, a, there was one man that was called the high priest, and he did the most important function of all and made the most important sacrifice of all, on, on a day called the Day of Atonement, which we still comes up on our calendar every year, the Day of Atonement, he would walk into the temple, and the temple had different divisions, had different courts, y'all with me? And he would walk in to the most, the backmost division, it was called the Holy of Holies, it was the most holy place in the temple, and he would take the Passover lamb that had been sacrificed, and he would, he would drip that blood upon the mercy seat above that, that, uh, that Ark of the Covenant, and it would symbolize the covering of sin for all of Israel. That might sound bizarre to you, but I want you to, I want you to buy into this for the sake of what we're going to talk about today. It's very important that this is, the, this is the culture, this is the religious environment that they had that was handed down to them through the law of Moses all the way out on Mount Sinai way back when, right? And because of all of that, it would have been significant for these Jewish believers who had known that all of their life to hear from, from this apostolic voice that Jesus has become their ultimate high priest, the ultimate mediator between God and man. He, see, this is God made flesh who became our Passover lamb. And in his ascension, he didn't go to a temple made by human hands. He went to the most holy place, to heaven itself, and presented the sacrifice not of a goat, not of sheep, but of his own blood securing once and for all our redemption. And so with all due respect to all these other religious systems, some of y'all that are in this room, I don't know where you come from, okay? And I'm not, tr I'm not like trying to offend for offensiveness sake. I'm trying to offend for like truth's sake, okay? Is that all right? And so, so with all due respect to everybody else, when you're in a Christian church and there is a priest or a priesthood, I'm just, I'm just telling you how it is, it's because they are still mediating something for you. It's because they are still mediating something for you. Some of them mediate a mass for you that is very necessary for you to receive uh, certain graces and benefits and indulgences for your salvation, right? Some of them are mediating a covenant that can only be found in their church. And they say, we have the authority. We alone have this priesthood. You, you can't get it anywhere else. And so if you come to us, we, because of this priesthood, we will mediate this special covenant between you and God. Or the sacraments in general. When we baptize, we really mean it, right? Because we have this priesthood. We are priests to God. But as I read my Bible, we have one mediator between God and man, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. That's it. That's what the Bible says. So I've titled this message, Jesus, Our High Priest. And I believe this. I believe that Jesus acting as our mediator significantly changes our life. I mean, it's too broad for me to narrow it down more than that. But we're going to talk about a few ways. And because Jesus is our high priest, I want to look at three significant changes for our Christian life. I want you to look first at verse 14 with me. If you still have your Bible open, we need to clear the fog of what is happening so that we can understand what is going down here. Our translation said, therefore, since we have a high priest, when, whenever you see a therefore, you need to figure out what the therefore is there for. And so in the verses before, it talks about how everyone must give an account before God. But thank God that we have a mediator in Jesus. He says everybody will have to stand at that judgment seat and will have to give an account to God of, of what they have done and they will be judged according to their works. What do we do? All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. How could any of us stand before a holy God? Thank God, therefore, you have a great high priest whose name is Jesus. And he passed through the heavens, it says. And that refers to the way. You've got to stay with me now. The high priest, he used to cross through the curtain, through the curtain in the temple to get to that most holy place. Now, Jesus has passed through the heavens, through the most holy place, to a place no earthly priest could ever go. The temple was just a shadow of these heavenly important things. And the writer of Hebrews, then he says this. He's our high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Why is that significant? It's significant because that's the very first time the book of Hebrews says the name of Jesus. 
Every other time, in those first four chapters before that, he says, the Son. He says some other variation of that. This is the first time the writer of Hebrews says, Jesus, the Son of God. And how this writer refers to Jesus is very important. Jesus is his earthly name given to Mary by an angel. It refers to his humanity. He is both Jesus of Nazareth and he's something else. He's the very Son of God, God in human flesh. Both of these ideas you must hold in tandem to understand how Jesus could ever be our mediator. See, Hebrews 2.17 says, He had to be like us, like his brothers and sisters in every way, so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in matters pertaining to God to make atonement for the sins of the people. Let me tell you something. It would be very difficult for, for there to be a mediator that is not human. He could not mediate between God and man if he did not really become God in flesh, if he only appeared to be human, if he was some sort of demi demigod figure like Hercules, right? This doesn't work. He, he's not that kind. He is fully 100% a human, and it would be impossible for a go-between to do a job if he was just a human, just a sinful human, just like you and I. So in Jesus, we find something very, very different, don't we? We find knitted together supernaturally in ways we can't even wrap our minds around. We have the essence of God in human flesh. That's the mystery of Christmas that we talk about every year. It's the mystery of the incarnation that God, the word became flesh and he dwelt among us. That though he appeared just like you and I and had the same temptations that you and I have, same, had the same frustrations that you and I have, he is something altogether utterly different at the same time. He is the God made flesh so he can be a great mediator for us. And for those who are struggling in their Christian walk today, here's what it all means. Jesus becomes our high priest. It changes everything, number one, because it allows us to hold on to the truth with perseverance. It encourages us to hold on to the truth with perseverance. Sarah and I, a while back, we were at the WMU Mission Celebration. And we were there early and we were trying to help get things going. It was a big, massive church with big stairs and, and big everything, right? And we had to haul these nine-foot tables across the building. And the, and the hard part was that we had to go upstairs with them, right? And so Sarah would go first, and I would, we would haul these nine-foot tables. They weren't really heavy because I'm a big muscle guy. I get it. But uh, they were kind of awkward, okay? And, and Sarah, I could tell, was having a little bit of trouble. So I had, to, you know, I had to really get my muscles going and all that stuff. So what we would do, and I, 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 this is probably not good. Don't tell anybody this. Don't tell the church we came from that we did this. But we would get these nine-foot tables up the stairs, and I could tell Sarah was you know, kind of hurting, right? And so we would put them down on the carpet, and we would just... We would start to slide them. That's probably not good for the carpet. Don't tell anybody that we did that. But uh, my secret, you know, it's between you and me, right, and everybody who can watch it on the live stream. We were sliding it on the carpet, right? And I don't know how many nine-foot tables we did. Probably 100. No, not that many. <laughs> totally. You bought into it. You totally bought it, right? That was such a fishtail. It was probably the third one in. I was sick of it. And so what I did, Sarah was in front of me. We got the table up there, and we placed it on the carpet, and then once, I, once she started going, I let go, and I walked away. And, I, and, I, and you know what? She was doing great, okay? She was doing great. She was hauling that table. I was getting my little rest in. I was feeling pretty good about it. Everything was going fine until she looked back and went, hey, and then dropped it. I mean, I mean she was doing great until that moment, and then she dropped it, lost control of it. It was like one of those cartoon characters that runs off the side of the cliff, right, and doesn't realize that they're, they've done it until they look down, then they fall, right? That's how she was, right? And it made me think about the things we hold on to, right, and the things we need help to hold on to. God's word says, hold fast to our confession. What does that mean? Our confession is the truth about God and his word, and, and these believers were struggling to be faithful, they, they were struggling to hold on, right? They were struggling to hold on to the truth and to, and to, and to let, have a claim upon it. And they thought maybe this, this whole life thing would be easier before Jesus. I, I wish I could just go back so I wouldn't, didn't have this hardship of following Jesus and people looking at me weird and people taunting me and people excluding me. And, and maybe I could just go back to when it was easier, right? And our temptations today are a lot different, but we struggle with those same thoughts, we say, man, it would be a whole lot easier if we didn't do that. The problem is, is you know, I, I, foreign missionaries fear the raised spear. The worst we have to fear is the raised eyebrow. We don't have the same temptations that they do, but we struggle with those same thoughts. 
But we have a high priest who's passed through the heavens for you, who made the ultimate sacrifice for you. So he says, hold on to the truth. This is worth holding on to. All the questions that you have, they find their answer in him. All the questions that those Jewish folk had in the, in the Old Testament, how does this all work? How are we ever going to get clean? You ever read the Old Testament? Right? You get to the end of it, and, and they're still broken. They're still going through patterns of sin. There, there's still no answer ultimately for this people of God. And then Jesus comes. And then Jesus arrives. And if you didn't have a Jesus as a high priest, who would you be holding on to? You might hang on to priests, to prophets, to scientists, to philosophers who are just mere sinful humans, just like you and me. But we have a great high priest in Jesus. And if you've trusted in him, you have someone who not only takes up for you, but has saved your own soul. So you must hold on to the truth, even when it is difficult, even when that is hard. I want you to look at verse 15 now. It says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. What that is, is that's a restatement of Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18, which says this, For because he himself has suffered and tempted, he is able to help those who have been tempted. That's what introduces that chapter, introduces this idea of him being a high priest. And our verse that we just said added an important element to that. It says, yet without sin. He became in every way like us. He was tempted in every way. He, he faced hardship just like, just like we do, yet without sin. Jesus lived a life that we could not live, and without that it would have been impossible for him to be a mediator for us. The word became flesh. He dwelt among us. And he took all of humanity's experiences, all of our sufferings, all of our temptation. Think about Jesus in the wilderness being tempted by Satan for 40 days and 40 nights there. He took that upon himself and he, he muscled through that in the strength of his father. And if you have suffered any kind of temptation in your life, I want to tell you, Jesus has suffered it in like kind. And you might scratch your head at that. And you might say, well, and, and to that, could, could, could that really be true? And to that I would say, Jesus has not been in every particular situation you have been in, but he has experienced the entire range of temptations, every single one of them. And from this verse, we can gather something else, can't we? That you can be tempted and yet not sin. It is possible, but I don't think it's probable for us. I don't think it's, it's possible because Jesus did it. He was tempted and yet did not sin. But I don't think it's probable for us to, you know what would be better? For us to not put ourselves in situations where we are tempted, Right? to just not allow that to happen. For most of us, we allow temptation to slide into a sin of the heart, if not a sin of the hands. Jesus said this, for example. He said, I tell you, and, and look, don't get mad at me. You take it up with Jesus, all right? Guys, this is real talk, and girls too. I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Men, does this mean that we cannot find, I'm just talking real talk here, that we cannot find women attractive, young, young boys, that we cannot find women attractive. I want to tell you, I'm not sure how any marriage would happen if that was not the case. But, listen, it's the longing glare, isn't it? It's the desire. It's the fantasizing. It's the objectification. It's the intention of the heart that makes it sinful. For us, the separation between temptation and sin is very, very gray. It's very, very obscure. But Jesus lived and he was tempted in every way and yet never committed sin. He never had that desire or intent built into his heart. And although Jesus remains separate from humanity, is sinless and holy because he has been tempted, because he is our mediator. Number two, we can relate to Jesus in our humanity. We, can, we, we have something in common with, with Jesus Almighty in this temptation, in the, in the frustrations of life. The story goes that an old couple, couple rose up early in the morning and kind of launched into their regular routine. The husband was there at the table reading the paper, and uh, the wife was there at the stove cooking breakfast. And the husband was in a mood that morning. You know how it is to be in a mood. And he peeked up at his newspaper, and he said, Hey, uh, wife, be careful with that burner. You're going to burn yourself. And the wife smiled and, and said, I know what I'm doing, honey. I've done this before. That's okay. A minute went by, and, and, and the man looked up at his newspaper again. He said, hey, you need to stir that gravy. You're going to burn that gravy. And the wife raised an eyebrow and said, okay, I, I know what I'm doing. I'm stirring the gravy. Don't worry. And a moment went by, and the husband said, make sure you salt those eggs. And 
The wife turned and he pointed the spatula at him and said, what is wrong with you? And the man said, I just wanted you to know how it feels to be driving with you. Right? I just want someone to know how I feel. Have you ever felt that way? I just want you to know how I feel. Have you ever felt that way? But in Jesus, we have a Savior, listen, who sympathizes with our weaknesses, our frustrations, our temptations, and he has conquered every one. He's also truly felt each one of these problems and yet has mercy and love towards us. Isaiah 42, 3, when it talks about the Messiah, you need to listen to this. Somebody needs to hear this in this room. Isaiah 42, 3. When he talks about the Messiah, it says this, a bruised reed he will not break. Some of y'all like a bruised reed today. You, ju- you just feel like you can't take one more thing. And, and the Messiah, he is gentle, he's tender towards you. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick. Some of y'all like a smoldering wick. You've been burned so many times. Even walking through this door was hard for you this morning because you've been burned so many times. You're so done with fake people. You're not sure you can deal with this religious stuff. You're like a smoldering wick. Some of y'all... Watch it online, you're like a smoldering wick. You've been burned so many times you can't even count. He says, a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Thank God Jesus is tender towards us. This is not a Messiah that is detached from our experiences, that, but he has walked in human shoes. He knows the feelings that you and I feel. And we never have to sit and wonder if the triune God understands us. We never have to. Our Savior does not sit in heaven aloof to the problems of humanity and yet judging us anyway. And it means that nothing you could go to Jesus with will surprise him. Nothing that you could pray to him, that you could confess to him, that you could confide in him would ever surprise him. If If you say this, if you say, Jesus, I'm thirsty, I'm hungry, and I'm in pain. Can I tell you something? Jesus knows how that feels. If you say... Jesus, I don't have any earthly resources, no stable home, very little support. Jesus knows how that feels. If you should pray this, Jesus, I'm at the lowest point that I have ever been in my life. I feel completely deserted and alone. Jesus knows what that feels like. He knows exactly what that feels like. And so we can relate and pray to this Savior. Look at verse 16 again with me. He says, therefore, because Jesus is our high priest, Let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that you may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. The temple at the very back, it was that holy of holies. And only one person got to enter there. And it was the high priest and he could go in once a year and and make atonement. And that place was symbolic for the very presence of God where it was manifest. It was like the very throne room of God. And separating that holy holies was this thick curtain and it is symbolic for how separate God is from us, how inaccessible he is to just mortal men and women. And, and it was like God's throne, and it should be understand, if it, if it is God's throne, that you should know that rulers back then were not exactly accessible. Today you can call your congressman, your congresswoman, you can write a letter to the president, but back then you could not hang out with the king. He was inaccessible. And you ladies that have studied the book of Esther, These last few months, you know that when Esther stood before the king without being summoned, she was taking her life and and it was forfeit, right? She was bringing great risk upon herself and her own life because the king could have just as easily ordered her to die. But something is different about this heavenly throne room because Jesus, our high priest, has entered in and he's offered the atonement of himself for the whole world. And when he died on the cross, the scripture said, And it's what it says, the curtain in that temple, it tore in two a feat that no man, no woman could ever perform. And it symbolized that the division between a holy God and sinful humanity is is torn down so that in Christ, this throne of God that we have is not a throne of judgment, but a throne of grace. Is anybody listening to me this morning? So we have a personal relationship. We can come in confidence and not in fear. That word confidence refers to that, that boldness that happens whenever you talk to somebody who is a greater rank than you. It is that confidence that we come before a holy God with the proper reverence always, and yet with confidence because he will not forsake us, and he will not abandon us, and he will not be inconsistent in his character. And we do not fear the judgment of being cast into hell because of the blood of Jesus upon us. 
We're still reverent before that God, but we know that this throne of grace issues mercy and help for those who are in Christ. Because Jesus is our high priest, number three, we approach God with confidence. We can hold on to the truth, we can relate to Jesus, and we can approach God with confidence. Everybody I know right now is talking about chat GBT. Anybody talk, heard about chat GPT? Nobody in this room. It's a couple of you, right? It's AI, and it's supposed to be the next revolution, next evolution in technology. Some say that it will replace Google. And Microsoft has already made a deal to integrate this AI technology in their search engine that nobody uses called Bing, right? Maybe that will change. Uh, that's like Google Plus, right? So Bing is, is, is already acquiring, Microsoft is acquiring this, this AI that takes all of the information, I don't know how it works, I'm just, I'm shooting from the hip here. It uses all, I imagine, all of the internet, right? All of the internet resources to generate uh, a conversation with you, and it's, it's pretty smart, right? And it can write you an answer based on whatever prompt you throw in. If you tell it to write you a poem about chicken strips, it will write you a poem about chicken strips. And listen, I would not be a proper pastor using this as an illustration for my sermon today if I did not, in fact, ask it to write a poem about chicken strips. So here we go. Chicken strips, oh so fine. A tasty meal that's always divine. Juicy and tender, oh so nice. A dish that's sure to entice. Golden brown and crispy too, with every bite of flavor anew. That was a, that was a good one, actually. No, 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 we ain't done. A perfect snack, of, you, you didn't get off that easy. A perfect snack, a perfect meal, the kind of food that makes you feel, wow. Whether with fries or on their own, chicken strips are never alone. A classic dish, a timeless treat, one that's always sure to compete. So if you're hungry and need a fix, look no further than some chicken strips. Satisfy your cravings, feed your soul, and enjoy this delicious gold. They kind of whiffed it on that last one, right? It's not exactly Shakespeare, but, it, but I asked them to write a poem about chicken strips. So what are you going to do, right? That was a computer that wrote a poem about chicken strips. And, and everyone is talking about this right now. In fact, the schools are having problems because people are, are putting in the prompts of their questions for their school. And, and, and the chat AI is, is spitting out answers. And then they're taking that kind of verbatim and, and using it as their answers, right? And uh, then, then they're developing software for how to tell if a computer wrote your answer or if you wrote your answer. I mean, there's all sorts of problems. People think that, it, wondering that it will change our economy. There may even be at least one AI-generated sermon being preached this morning, somewhere out there in the universe. I promise you it was not this one. But God's Word says we can freely come to His throne for wisdom and grace in our time of need. Just like Xerxes put out his scepter to Esther, ladies, and said, you can come in. God has allowed us to approach the throne room in prayer and devotion, and he will help us. It has to do with reverence and not punishment. For there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. First John 4.18 says, with the proper reverence, we're able to speak plainly and honestly to the Lord. You have that invitation. You can approach boldly the throne of grace, knowing that Jesus is ready to help you. No one is better equipped to handle the pains and struggles of life than Jesus is. No, no chat, no AI, no technology, only Jesus. And in the world, in a world of people who are living life through the phone camera, it's nice to know we have somebody who cares, who is there for us. You've seen these ads maybe in Super Bowl, Right? He gets us. Have you seen those? He gets us. And there is some truth there. There's definitely some truth there. He, I, I, I like some of those ads. In fact, the ones that they showed at Super Bowl, I, 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 didn't, I didn't study them. I didn't have a Bible open to you know, do that. But I, I seem to enjoy them. They seem pretty, pretty good. And even if we don't agree with everything that everybody involved with it says, which I, I think is true too. There was a mentor in my life that said, you need to learn to eat the meat and spit out the bones. There are things in life where you need to be able to absorb what is good out of something while rejecting. So not everything is black and white, right? Not everybody is like the old westerns. They wear white hats when they're good guys. They wear black hats when they're bad guys. Not everyone, the world is not like that. And so you need to learn to take what is valuable and reject what is not valuable, what is not true. That's what he taught me to do. And that's what we need to do with those ads. In reality, I, you know, I just pray that somebody somewhere 
somehow despite ourselves. Guess what? It'll be, it'll be maybe despite the organization that they come to Jesus, but every time I preach, I say, despite me, despite me, despite who I am and all my problems, let something I say bless somebody, right? I just pray Super Bowl somewhere. Like I, I hope somewhere, some, some way, somebody is seeking Jesus because of it, because he gets us. That's true. He gets us. That's what this text says. It says he, he has been tempted in every way. He understands us. He lived a life we couldn't live. He died a death that we deserve. And so, you, look, friends, we, we can never shake a fist at God and say, if only you knew what I was going through, or you have no idea what it feels to be me. In fact, I, I quite think that when we do that, Jesus is looking lovingly at us with outstretched, nail-pierced hands. He says, no, you have no idea what I went through. You have never felt the just wrath of God on my shoulder. In fact, because of me, you will never feel what I have felt. That's what he says. There's no other so-called God in history that could ever say they walked a mile in your shoes and understand what you understand. He gets us. But do you get him? Do you get Jesus? Did you know that he died for you, that he was buried, that he rose again three days later? Have you placed your trust, your faith in him, and the sacrifice that he made for you, that when you depart from this life, you will close your eyes to this existence and open your life, your eyes to eternity with him forever? Do you know that? Do you know this high priest who has made the ultimate sacrifice that, so that you could hold on to this gospel truth? that you could be in relationship with Jesus, that you could boldly approach a holy God without fear. My, my ask of you is to surrender to Jesus. Even if you've been a Christian for 15 years, 30 years, 45 years, 65 years, 85 years, surrender to Jesus. Wherever you are, right, whether you're like a burning wick or you feel like you're quite strong, surrender to Jesus. And maybe that takes the form of, of walking an aisle like this and bowing at, a, at an altar like this and just giving it to the Lord as a symbol of what you're doing in your heart. Maybe you need to make an altar right where you are right now. Maybe you need to turn in your seat and just cry out to the Lord right where you sit and just respond to them. And as we sing, maybe, it's, maybe you just need to sing and worship to him and what he's done in reverence to everything he is to you. Maybe you need to pray right now just seek the Lord's face. Maybe you just need to stay silent and just pray right where you are and seek the Lord while he may be found because he is our high priest. He is the one who loved us, who passed through the heavens for us and we can walk boldly to him because of that relationship because we are called not slaves, not servants. We're called sons and daughters of that king. Would you stand with me? Father, as we approach a moment of decision, Lord, this is a moment, even as we sing, that folks can respond, can seek your face. Lord, let this be a moment where folks in the sound of my voice, in this room or in a live stream somewhere, might cry out to you. Say, oh Lord, that's me. That's me that feels so alone. Would you remind me that you walked in difficulties that I walked, and yet without sin, you serve as a model for me. Oh Lord, maybe, maybe there are some who say, man, it just seems like life would be so easier without this stuff. But would you remind them of your worth? and your glory and the, what it means to hold on to truth. Young hearts in this room, what it means to securely hold on to truth, even when they see people letting go of the truth all around them. Father, to the one who cannot but manage a prayer, would you give them that boldness that says you can go? Like Xerxes who holds out a scepter says you can, you can approach the king. Father, you, you get us. Help us to understand you and to know you. 
so that we might be found in you and your power. Lord, let there be business done with God in this room today and outside of this room as we seek your face, as we seek to honor you. We pray these things in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen. Let's sing together. Let's respond to him. Jesus is tenderly calling you home, calling to decision today. I, I just ask you one thing you can do is you can text decision to 636-742-1011. That's a way that we can communicate with you about, if you're watching online, you're just like not sure what to do and how to arrange a meeting with the pastor. Or God is working on your life. That's one way that you can do that. Just text that and we'll get in touch with you right quick. And so um, if, you're, if you're wrestling with a, if you're right here, you're wrestling with a decision today. Uh, don't wait. Don't wait. Seek after the Lord and, and reach out to, to me. I can connect you with a deacon, and we can, uh, we can begin to figure out what the Holy Spirit is leading you to do. What we're going to do is uh, let me sit you down. We've got plenty of time, plenty of time. And as our deacons come, we're going to prepare for the Lord's Supper. Um, the, the Lord Jesus told us to do this in remembrance of him. And so on the night that he was betrayed, they were, the disciples were there in the upper room, and they were, uh, they were having the Passover meal together. Here in, in a few weeks, we will have a, uh, a mock Passover together, a little bit of a small Seder meal together. And we'll be able to explore some of the richness of that. But there they were, they were, they were all, Jesus and all of his disciples were Jewish, and they were celebrating, they, they were in obedience to the Old Testament, and they were taking the Passover, and Jesus reinterpreted some of the elements of that Passover and gave new meaning to them as an ordinance. What that means is Jesus commanded us to do it, and so we do it, right? And uh, as followers of him, this is something that he told us to do. Just like he told us to baptize, that's the other ordinance. He told us to do this, to take a cup and take, a, 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 um, take the bread, and he gave it meaning. He said, this is my body broken for you. So just as we take in bread and are, are sustained by it, as believers, we take in the sacrifice of Jesus and we are spiritually sustained and given life because of that. He took that cup of wine and he lifted it up and he said, this is my blood in a new covenant for you. And, uh, and so as we take it, we are reminded of that covenant that he has made that was sealed by the blood of Jesus. And so we do it in remembrance of him. And so there's a past element to it. But also as we take it, there is a relational element to it right here in the present day. We take it together and we're reminded that just as there is one bread, just as the, there is one cup, we are one body. And so my challenge to you is, is to dwell on the gospel message in the past. And yet in this moment, in our time of reflection together, to think about your relationships, right? Maybe even in this room and folks that are, outside of this room, and to be in good standing with them, to maybe repent of some things that are in your heart that would stop you from taking this with a pure, uh, pure heart, to reflect on that. That's what the scripture says. It says to take it worthily. Now, we come to the gospel unworthy. And so that's, the point is not to be good enough to take the Lord's Supper, but the point is to have a good heart in taking it. That's why Paul said it. The Lord's Supper reminds us of our unworthiness of salvation, and yet Jesus made a way. And so, but we need to take careful consideration to our heart. So as we take it, we remember what he has done in the past. We remember, we celebrate what he is doing right here in our family of faith 
together. And then what it says, Paul says, for as often as we take this bread and take this juice, we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again. So you see, it has a past element, it has a present element, and it has a future element that, that as we are obedient, 2,000 years later, the church is remaining to be obedient to take this ordinance that Jesus has come and, and Jesus spilled his blood and we are proclaiming, there's an evangelistic element to that too, isn't there? We're continuing to proclaim the Lord's death until he returns again. And so as you meditate upon the Lord's Supper today, would you reflect upon our mission, our collective mission together of proclaiming this gospel? That word proclaiming, I'm reading a lot about this lately. That word proclaiming has to do with heralding. The king of that day, they would have heralds that would go out and they would proclaim good news. And sometimes they would go in a city and they would blow the trumpet and they would say, the king is here in your town. The king has come. The king, the king came back from his war. He has proclaimed victory. He defeated all of his enemies. And in the gospel, we are like heralds proclaiming the king has come and he has defeated his enemies. He has conquered death. And, he is, and we are proclaiming victory over sin and death and shame in Jesus' name. So we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Here's some instructions. Um, these are, they look like a hourglass. On one side is the bread. On one side is uh, the, the wine. It is not uh, alcohol wine. It is juice. And on one side, uh, we will take the bread first. You can, when, as soon as we get it to you, you can begin to work that side. It's plastic. Sometimes it's a little difficult. You see somebody struggling, you feel comfortable. Uh, help each other out, right? That's a good way for us to be a family of faith together. And so uh, you can begin to work on that. It'll be a little noisy. That's okay. Uh, so we can, we can work that, and we'll take the bread together. If you're not a member of First Baptist Church of Grace, some of your name is not on an uh, official role, but you name the name of Jesus today. You, you can say in your heart, I know Jesus as Lord. One, because of Jesus, one day I will die and I will spend eternity with him. If you can proclaim that, feel free to take the Lord's Supper with us today, okay? Uh, we would love for everybody to be a member and have their name on that, that role, but be it as it may, if you're here and you know Jesus, you come and you take the Lord's Supper with us. However, uh, this is what the Bible tells us to do. If you are... Uh, if you are not a believer today, if you are here and uh, you are enjoying yourself, but you can say, I know that I am not a Christian. I'm not a practicing Christian. I do not know Jesus. We would ask you in obedience to what the scripture tells us to do, to go ahead and let that pass. And I'll tell you what I'll do. If there is anyone in this room who lets that pass because, uh, because you are not a believer, I will buy you lunch. Okay, I will do that because I'm not trying to exclude you from a meal. I'd be glad to have a meal with you and tell you about Jesus. Okay, all right. And then we can make sure that next time we have the Lord's Supper that you can with confidence take that element. I would be glad to do that. We're not trying to exclude you from anything. We're trying to be obedient to what the scripture tells us to do. And this is an ordinance for believers. Does that make sense? Okay, so uh, I'm going to pray and we're just going to spend a lot of time. We got plenty of time today, and so this will be a good time for us to reflect and to pray. I just invite you to confess your sins to the Lord as we pray, to, to just seek him in your hearts and let this time be a time of stillness as, as Barb plays and as the, the deacons help to administer and serve this. Let's eat it together. If I didn't say that before, you can work that packaging, but wait for me, and we'll, I'll give instructions so that we can eat it together, okay? So don't jump the gun on that, but let this be a time that you reflect on. Remember what Jesus did for you remember what we have in this room and, and confess your sin to Jesus in this moment and, and think about our mission together as we proclaim the Lord's death and what that means for you today. Let's pray. Father, we come to this moment and Lord, we claim the words of 1 John 1, 9 that says that if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from our righteousness. Lord, if there is, if there is a, a, a hatefulness in this room, if there is anger in this room, if there is bitterness in this room, uh, if there's a grudge in this room, uh, if there's hurt in this room, Lord, would, would you help us to lay it at your feet right in this moment? That, that includes me and my family as, as well, Lord. And, and Father, in the course of time, you, you, we, you know this. As our high priest, you know 
that we walk through hurt and pain and we carry that like baggage with us, but you tell us to, to lay down our burdens at your feet. And so, Father, let us take a moment and do that. Uh, let, let us just confess it to you. Father, let there be people who are with bowed head and bowed prostrate spirit, Lord, confessing sin to you even now. Father, would you bring to mind what you did on a cruel cross as your blood spilled out, your, your body was torn for our forgiveness so that the, the sins of the world, the punishment of the sins of the world was laid upon you. You, beca- you who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. Father, thank you. And help us to remember the cross and the empty tomb as we take this. And Lord, help us think about our mission, that this is a proclamation together. This is a heralding that the king has come And there's reason to celebrate because you've conquered your enemies. And Lord, you're coming again one day to finish this story of redemption that was written throughout eternity and will go on for eternity. As we take it, would you help us to seize the meaning of this? And Lord, let it be rich upon our spirit. Would you bless us with your grace as we approach that throne of grace with confidence? remembering what you've done and walking in obedience to the ordinance that you have given us. In Jesus' name, amen. A moment to just rip that off and take this. The symbol of the broken body of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
you just turn that? Be careful. The symbol of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me pray, and Sarah's going to sing us out this familiar song. Why don't you stand with us? Father, we thank you for the cross. Just as these elements, they enter in, Lord, because of your sacrifice, we have a spirit within us. We have redemption in your name. We have hope inside of us. Lord, we remember you. Lest we forget, in the midst of all of our busyness, our struggles, our anxieties, Father, we, we remember what you've done on the cross. Lord, we proclaim it because one day you'll come and finish the story. Lord, let us be a family here. Let us confess sin, not only to you, but one to another, that we might, as we partake of one bread, one cup, Lord, we might be one body together. We pray, Lord, that we have glorified you together as we remember what you have done and, and seek to walk in obedience to what you have told us. Let us now walk in love as we sing and then enter into our mission field. Lord, your spirit be with us to proclaim, to herald that same salvation to those that we meet. In Jesus' name, amen.